Let's revise KCC Biology 2023 Paper 1. On to our first question. Name the disease caused by the following microorganisms. Part A. Entamoeba histolytica. Of course, this disease is amoebic dysentery. Part B. Plasmodium oval. And that is malaria. Question 2. State two sites in animals where countercurrent flow of fluids occurs. Okay, first things first. Let us just remind ourselves of what the countercurrent system is about. So the countercurrent system is a system that is found in organisms. So it refers to a mechanism whereby you're going to have fluids, for example, blood and water, flowing in opposite directions. Now, the reason why this happens is so as to enhance the exchange of materials, you know, such as gases, oxygen and carbon four oxide or solutes. Now, let's give two examples of where the countercurrent system is found in organisms. Number one is the gills of fish. You're going to have blood flowing in one direction while water flows in the opposite direction across the gills. Now, this arrangement maximizes the concentration gradient of oxygen between the water and the blood. So, it facilitates the efficient oxygen absorption and also the removal of carbon four oxide. So by maintaining a countercurrent flow, the fish can then extract maximum oxygen from the water and also effectively remove carbon four oxide. So the carbon four oxide will then be uptaken by the water and removed from the fish's body. Okay, so another example is found in the renal system of mammals. So within the nephrons of the kidneys, you're going to have blood and the glomerular filtrate flowing in opposite directions. Now this is especially seen in the loop of Henle. So this system ensures the maximum reabsorption of water and mineral salts. Now there is a third example and that is the placenta. Moving on to part B. Explain the significance of the countercurrent flow system in living organisms. Okay, this question is simply asking you for why the countercurrent system is important and we have already mentioned it. But since I explained it using so many words, you can simply write your answer as such to maintain a steep concentration gradient for efficient exchange of materials. And that is that. Now, moving on to part three, the following diagram represents parts of the female reproductive system. Part A, identify the part labeled F. Okay, now if we look at part F, we can see that this is the vagina. Part B, explain the structural adaptation of the part labeled E to its function. Now, part E represents the uterus. So if we look at the uterus, you'll find that the uterus has a thick muscular lining. And this wall is very, very important because it's made of muscles and muscles have the unique ability to expand. And by expanding, it provides for more space that can accommodate the growing fetus. Moving on to the next part, part C. Use letter H to label on the diagram the part where ectopic pregnancy is likely to occur. Okay, now before we can tackle this question, we need to know what ectopic pregnancy is about. Now, ectopic pregnancy is a pregnancy whereby you're going to have the fertilized egg implanting and growing in the fallopian tube. Now, in the fallopian tube is where fertilization takes place. Once the egg has been fertilized, you know, leading to the formation of the zygote, it then moves towards the uterus where it implants. This is where it attaches and grows to be to form the fetus and so on but you find that in some cases the fertilized egg continues to develop within the fallopian tube it does not move to the uterus where it's supposed to be now this is a very dangerous condition so it can even cause the fallopian tube to rupture because the fallopian tube was not constructed to house a developing fetus now this is what is termed as the ectopic pregnancy now, I know, I know, some of you might be wondering, okay, why can't the fertilized egg grow within the fallopian tube and not instead the uterus? Now, there are actually several reasons for this. I'm going to just mention two. The fallopian tube is not designed to support the growth of a developing embryo in terms of space. Now, unlike the uterus, which has a thick muscular wall that is capable of stretching, you know, and accommodating a growing fetus, the fallopian tube does not have this. So you find that if the fertilized egg continues to grow and increases in size, it can cause the fallopian tube to actually rupture, to actually break apart. Danger, danger. Now, another reason is that 
the uterus is highly vascularized it has a dense network of capillaries which is very important for provision of oxygen and nutrients to the growing fetus the fallopian tube does not have this so the fetus cannot develop within the fallopian tube and this is what is termed as the ectopic pregnancy so where the ectopic pregnancy occurs is the fallopian tube and that is where it is Moving on to question number four, the following diagram represents a skull of a certain mammal. Part A, state the likely mode of nutrition for the animal from which the skull was obtained from. Now, if we look at the skull itself, you can clearly see there are certain hints that will let you know which mode it is. By the way, when you talk about the mode of nutrition in this case, there are only three possibilities, carnivorous, omnivorous, and herbivorous. Now, you find that sometimes students confuse this and write carnivore, omnivore, or herbivore instead. This is completely wrong. Now, our mode of nutrition is carnivorous. And the reason why we state it's this is because if you look at the canines, you can clearly see that the canines are long and pointed for grasping and tearing flesh. Now, another is the incisors. You're also going to have sharp incisors for cutting flesh. Our last point is the carnassial teeth. Now, what are carnassial teeth? So, carnassial teeth are specialized teeth that are found in carnivores. These are actually modified premolars and molars. You know, they've had their structure changed a bit in order for them to perform a specific function. Now, what is the function of carnassial teeth? They slice flesh and crush bones. So, how are they adapted for doing this? Number one is that you're going to have teeth that have very sharp edges for slicing flesh and number two is that you're going to find that the carnassial teeth are arranged in such a way whereby they can actually crisscross and interlock with one another this allows them to easily slice through flesh and crush bones so any of those three reasons is correct moving on to our next question students observed that the smell from a decomposing animal carcass was stronger at midday than early in the morning part a Name the physiological process by which the smell reached the students. Now, guys, whenever you have a question and it's asking you to identify the physiological process, just remember there are only three possibilities. It's diffusion, osmosis, or active transport. Now, osmosis does not apply in this case because osmosis deals with water molecules only. Active transport also does not apply because it involves movement of particles using energy. Now, whatever process we're seeing here is clearly passive. You know, you're having molecules clearly moving from one point to another without requiring energy to do so. So we are only left with one possibility, and that is diffusion. Part B, account for the observation made by the students. So they're asking you for the explanation. Like, how is it that during midday, the students observed that the smell was stronger than any other time or than early in the morning? Now, you're going to explain, yes, you're having particles diffusing from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration, but you're also going to take into account the temperature factor. So how are you going to explain it? You're going to start as such. Temperatures are higher at midday, which increases the rate of diffusion by providing the particles with kinetic energy. And therefore, the molecules diffuse faster from the region where they are at a higher concentration. And that is that. Question number six, state two ways in which sweating is significant to the human body. Now, number one is that thermoregulation. It helps in regulating our body temperature. And number two, it's also crucial to excretion. How? Because it helps us in getting rid of waste products such as urea and excess water. Moving on to question number seven, set three characteristics of kingdom monera that are not found in kingdom animalia okay this should be easy because i believe that out of the five kingdoms the two kingdoms that are very very different from one another are kingdom monera and kingdom animalia so number one we are going to start with prokaryotic so you'll find that members of kingdom monera are prokaryotic while those from kingdom animalia are eukaryotic okay let's pause there what do we mean by these two terms? Now, when it comes to members of Kingdom Monera, you know, bacteria, they're going to have their nuclear material scattered within the cytoplasm. You know, it's not surrounded by a nuclear membrane. And this is simply what is termed as prokaryotic. 
Now for the members of the four remaining kingdoms, you know Protoctista, Fungi, Plantae and Animalia, these are eukaryotic. So they have the nuclear material surrounded by a membrane. Now another characteristic is that bacterial cells have cell walls. Animal cells of course lack cell walls. And the third characteristic is that members of kingdom Monera are unicellular. So all bacteria are unicellular and therefore microscopic. Animals, on the other hand, are multicellular. By the way, if you would like to refresh your knowledge on Kingdom Monera, be sure to check out this video. Moving on to question 8, the following diagram illustrates a setup to investigate a certain physiological process. Aha, uh -huh, we are back to the physiological processes. The setup was left undisturbed for 10 minutes. Name the physiological process under investigation. Okay, let's look at our setup first. We are having a visking tubing, which is a semi-permeable membrane. So by semi-permeable, I simply mean that it has tiny, tiny pores that will allow molecules that are small enough to pass across. Molecules that are larger cannot pass across. Water molecules are small enough to do so. Now within the visking tubing, we have a concentrated salt solution. Now the visking tubing has been immersed in a beaker containing distilled water. Now guys, guys, whenever you see two solutions such as this, separated by a semi-permeable membrane, you don't even have to think about it. This is testing osmosis. So the physiological process under investigation is osmosis. Part B, state the observation made after 10 minutes. Now when it comes to osmosis, there are three things that should always be at the forefront of your mind. Number one, Determine the differences in the concentration. Number two, the flow of water. And number three, what is the net effect? Now, if we look at the two solutions that we have, we have a conch salt solution and distilled water. So one is going to be hypertonic to the other. In this case, it's going to be the concentrated salt solution. Why? Because it has more solids and less solvent. You know, more salt compared to the other. So this is our hypertonic solution. Now, when it comes to the flow of water, water molecules will always move from the hypotonic solution to the hypertonic solution. So we're going to have water molecules moving from the distilled water across the semi-permeable visking tubing into this concentrated salt solution. Hypo to hyper. Last, what is going to be the effect of the flow of water? You're going to have the visking tubing expanding or swelling. What about the water in the beaker? there's going to be a drop or a decrease in the level of water within the beaker. And those are your two observations. So observation number one, the level of water in the beaker dropped. Observation number two, the visking tubing expanded or became swollen more than what it was. <laughs> okay, so part number C, account for the observations made in 8B. So we are simply supposed to explain how is it that we observed these two. So the water in the beaker is hypotonic to the salt solution in the visking tubing. That is our first point. Next, we are going to talk about the flow of water. So water molecules moved across the semi-permeable visking tubing, causing it to swell. And there we have it. Question number nine. In a genetic study, a pure breeding black bull was crossed with a pure breeding white hypha. All the offsprings were black. Okay, pause, pause. You want to tell me that we are having two parents, a black bull and a white female. And at the end of the day, all the offsprings are black with no trace of white whatsoever in their phenotype, you know, in their observable characteristic. Whenever you see such a case, you need to know that this is an example of complete dominance. Okay, in case you're wondering, what is complete dominance? Now, complete dominance is a type of inheritance whereby you're going to have one allele being completely dominant over the other. So one allele is dominant over the other, which is going to be termed as recessive. So what do we mean by dominant? The dominant allele completely masks or hides the effect of the other allele. So in this case, we're going to have the offsprings having a genotype consisting of one allele from the bull and one allele what do we call a female cow by the way okay and one allele from the female cow but when it comes to their phenotype the observable characteristic you're not seeing this you're only seeing the black fur color so in this case 
the gene that is responsible for the black fur color is dominant over the one that is responsible for the white fur color mm -hmm. and therefore masks its expression. So how do you answer this? The gene for black color coat was dominant over the gene for white color coat and was therefore expressed as such. So part B, work out the genotypic ratio of the offsprings if the pure breeding black bull was crossed with a female heterogeneous for color. Okay, your first step is determining the phenotype of the parents. Now, in the case of the bull, we are already told that it's black in color. So you're going to have a bull that has a black fur coat. What about in the case of the female? You're told that the female is heterozygous. Now, heterozygous simply means it has two different alleles. One allele for the black fur color and one allele for the white fur color. So what is its phenotype going to be? Simple. It's going to be black too. Why? Because the allele for black fur color is dominant over the allele for white fur color. So that is our phenotype. Now moving on to our genotype, those are the genotypes. Next, simply a matter of crossing. And there we have the genotypes. And there we have the genotypes of the offsprings. Now getting the genotypic ratio, we are simply going to look at the genotypes of the offsprings. So we have two BBs, capital Bs, and two heterozygous. So that's a ratio of one is to one. Proceeding to question 10, account for the following observations. Part A, when the pancreatic duct of a mammal is blocked, blood sugar regulation remains normal while digestion is impaired. Now I want to say something, you might already be aware of it, but whenever you, are, you have a question and it's asking you to account for something, it simply means that it's asking you to explain whatever they want. So we are being told that if you were to block the pancreatic duct of a mammal, it will affect digestion but not regulation of blood sugar level. Now in case you're wondering how are these two things connected, you know digestion and regulation of blood sugar level, then the reason is because both of these two are influenced by the pancreas. Okay, let's start with digestion. When you talk about digestion, the pancreas is actually an accessory organ. So it secretes pancreatic juice, which plays a huge role in digestion of food substances in the duodenum. You know, the first part of the small intestine. So if you were to block the pancreatic duct, now the pancreatic duct is a, a tube-like structure that connects the pancreas to the duodenum. So essentially, you find that the pancreatic juice passes through the pancreatic duct on its way to the duodenum. So if you were to close off this duct, what will happen is that the pancreatic juice cannot be transported to the duodenum. And so, of course, digestion is going to be impaired. But, but, if digestion is going to be impaired, why is not regulation of blood sugar level? Now, the pancreas releases two hormones that are instrumental in controlling the amount of glucose that is present within our blood. Now, these, ho these hormones are insulin and glucagon. So insulin is released when the blood sugar levels are high, you know, they're above normal, especially after digestion of a meal. So insulin is released and what happens is that it initiates a series of events that ensures that the blood sugar level goes back down to normal. Glucagon, on the other hand, is released when the blood sugar levels are below normal. For example, if you haven't eaten for a long time or if you're fasting. So glucagon again initiates a series of steps to ensure that the blood sugar level rises back up to normal. By the way, if you want an in-depth explanation on this, I have a video for that. So essentially, the pancreas is crucial for regulation of blood sugar level through the production of insulin and glucagon. But if we block the pancreatic duct, it's going to affect digestion and not blood sugar regulation. And yes, that is actually correct. And the reason for this is because hormones do not pass through the pancreatic duct. They are released directly into the bloodstream. So what happens is that these hormones diffuse from the pancreas into the bloodstream where they're then transported to the rest of the body, you know, where they need to function. And that is the reason why blood sugar regulation is not affected when the pancreatic duct is blocked. On to part B. Most desert animals have larger loops of Henle. Okay, now, what is the loop of Henle? This is a part, a U-shaped part that is found within the nephron. Now, the main function of the loop of Henle is reabsorption of water and mineral salts. Now, if it was a desert animal, 
what will happen is that it needs to reabsorb as much water as possible because it lives in an environment where there's scarcity of water so it cannot afford to lose a lot of its water through urine so what needs to happen is that it needs to excrete urine that is very little and highly concentrated what happens to the remaining water it's reabsorbed back into the body where it can then be utilized so when it comes to the loop of henley you will find that desert animals tend to have larger and longer loops of henley to increase the surface area for maximum reabsorption of water and mineral salts why because they live in environments where there's a shortage of water so the effect of this is that the urine that is produced by such animals is going to be number one highly concentrated and very little moving on to question 11 the following diagrams represents beaks of different birds okay so we can clearly see that the beaks are of different shapes different sizes even of different lengths so part a state the type of evolution illustrated by the diagram now this type of evolution is referred to as divergent evolution now in the case of divergent you are having you're going to have organisms that have a common ancestry you know they evolved from a common ancestor but they diverged along at some point because they were exposed to different environments in this case different diets so these birds feed on different types of food and that is the reason why they evolved different types of pigs okay part b explain the significance of the type of evolution stated in 11a so what is the importance of divergent evolution specifically in the case of beaks so the beaks enable the birds to exploit different niche this reduces competition for food okay moving on to question 12 the following equation represents a certain metabolic reaction taking place in animal cells okay we have a chemical equation there so we can clearly see that we are having a food substance Somehow reacting with oxygen, leading to the production of carbon four oxide, water, and energy. Ding dong. Energy. And the presence of oxygen lets you know that this is respiration, specifically aerobic respiration. Now, part A is telling us, name the organelle where the reaction occurs. So, this is the mitochondrion. Part B1, calculate the respiratory quotient of the substrate being oxidized. Now, if you want to calculate the respiratory quotient, by the way, respiratory quotient refers to the ratio of the volume of carbon 4 oxide produced against the volume of oxygen used during respiration so that is our formula so this gives us 18 over 26 now in case you're wondering where are these numbers coming from if you look at the equation we are having 26 moles of oxygen being used and 18 moles of carbon 4 oxide being produced so that is thus so this gives us an answer of 0.6923 now, for those of you who love rounding up, you know, the decimal places, it's okay. But the minimum you're supposed to round it off to should be to two decimal places. So don't write something like 0 0.7, okay? Ah, now moving on. Identify the substrate being oxidized in the reaction. So we have three possibilities. It could either be glucose, you know, a carbohydrate, or it could be a lipid, or it could be a protein. Now, respiratory quotients lets us know two things. Number one, whether this is aerobic or anaerobic respiration. So if you get a value that is one or less than one, that is aerobic respiration. Now, it can also let us know whether this is anaerobic respiration. So if you have a value that is above one, one point something, that is anaerobic respiration because you're going to have very little oxygen being utilized very little oxygen or none at all being utilized in this process now another purpose of the respiratory quotient is that it also informs us of the type of substrate so if you have a substrate that gives you a rq of one or close to one that is a carbohydrate gives you 0 0.7 that is a lipid so in this case we're getting 0 0.69 which is just close to 0 0.7 so that means our substrate is a lipid now, if you were to get 0 0.9, that is a protein. So part C, state two factors other than oxygen concentration that can affect the rate of the illustrated reaction. So essentially, it's asking you for factors that affect the rate of respiration. Now, there are several factors. 
So apart from oxygen concentration, you're going to have substrate concentration. Substrate, of course, refers to the food substance that is being broken down. So for example, glucose and in this case, lipids. So if you have a lot of substrate, we are going to expect that the rate of respiration will be fast. Now, another is favorable pH, optimum temperature, uh, enzyme concentration, enzyme inhibitors. Okay, now in case you're wondering, how are these all related to respiration? Respiration is a process that is controlled by enzymes. So whatever affects enzyme will ultimately affect the process of respiration. Moving on to question 13. The following diagram illustrates a neuron. A Roman 1, identify the neuron. Okay, this is the intermediate or the relay neuron. A Roman 2, give a reason for your answer. So why is this the relay neuron? Why not sensory? Why not motor? Now the reason is because it lacks the myelin sheath. Now this is tied. So if you were to miss out on A Roman 1, A Roman 2 will not be marked. So it doesn't have the myelin sheath. Now this is a characteristic feature of the relay neuron. B Roman 1, name the part labeled P on the diagram. So these are the dendrites. Now if you were to write dendrite, that would be wrong because we can clearly see that P is pointing at two of these, so plural. B Roman 2 said the function of the part named in 13B. So what are the function of the dendrites? These dendrites are used for transmission of nerve impulses, you know, from one neuron onto the other. Question number 14. In an experiment, students added some water to a beaker containing maize flour and yeast. The beaker was covered and left on the laboratory bench undisturbed for three days. Part A, set the aim of the experiment. Okay, now let's look at the question. We are having a beaker containing maize flour and yeast in it. Yeast. By the way, whenever you see yeast with a substrate, it should ring bells in your head. But this is probably respiration. Now, the type of respiration that yeast cells carry out is anaerobic respiration. So, moving on to part A, the aim of this experiment is to investigate anaerobic respiration. Now, if you were to write to investigate fermentation, that will also be correct. Part B, set two observations made by the students after three days. Okay, so I can imagine that what will happen after three days is the yeast cells will have carried out anaerobic respiration. Now, by carrying out anaerobic respiration, this will lead to the production of carbon-4 oxide gas. So, I should expect to see some bubbling, fizzing, you know, from the contents of the beaker. And also, you're going to find, you're going to scent an alcoholic smell because one of the contents is going to be ethanol. Now, another observation is actually with regards to a temperature change. So, you'll find that the beaker has increased in temperature and has become warmer to the touch. And the reason for this is because respiration as a process produces a lot of energy. Some of this energy is released in form of heat. So that is the reason why you're going to have an increase in the temperature of the contents of the beaker. Question number 15, part A. State two characteristics likely to be observed in a 25-year-old male incapable of producing enough testosterone. Okay, so essentially they are asking you what are the symptoms that you're going to find or what are the effects that you're going to find in an in individual that does not have enough testosterone? So number one, you're going to have a chest that is less hairy. So testosterone is an androgen, you know, it's a male hormone that is responsible for the masculine characteristics. So the male is going to have a chest that is less hairy. In fact, it's not only going to be limited to the chest. You're going to talk about less hair in different parts of the body, such as even in the chin, you know, facial hair, in the armpits, in the pubic area, and so on. The male is going to be less muscular, have smaller testes, even a smaller penis, failure to produce sperms, you know, less sperm production. 15 part B. Name one part. In plants where auxins are produced, okay, the auxins are produced in the apical meristem, you know, the meristematic tissues. So these are the apical bud or even at the tips of the roots. Any of these is correct. Question 16, part A, name the branch of biology that deals with the study of insects. Ah, this is a sweet question. So that is entomology. Part B, name one piece of apparatus one will use to collect insects 
for study. So there are actually multiple ones. You can mention the sweep net, the specimen bottle, the pitfall trap, the bait trap, even a pair of forceps, a putter, all of these are correct. Question number 17a, distinguish between magnification and resolution as used in microscopy. Okay, now let's start with magnification. Magnification is the ability of a microscope to enlarge smaller objects to the desired size. Why? For clarity, so that you can see the features of a specimen clearer. Now, when it comes to the resolution, this is the ability to distinguish between two structures that are close to one another as distinct entities. Okay, that's a lot. Let me explain resolution. Now, what happens is that when... Okay, let me explain resolution in terms of a phone. You know, sometimes you have a phone, you've taken a picture, and you want to zoom in. So we can imagine zooming in is magnification. So you want to zoom in to see a certain characteristic better. Now, with a lot of smartphones, you find that the more you zoom in, you know, the more you magnify it, the resolution decreases. So you, it reaches a point whereby the features are so indistinct, you cannot even tell what you're looking at. Now, this is a characteristic of a lot of uh, phones. You know, they have a low resolution. But in the case of the microscope, you find that even though you continuously magnify a specimen, you can still tell that these are two different structures. Even though those two structures might be located close to one another, you can tell that this is one structure and this is another one. So that is resolution. Moving on to part B. Set the significance of the following procedures during the preparation of temporary wet mounts of plant tissues. So you find that if you want to prepare slides of uh, tissues or a specimen, there are certain steps that are included. One of them being staining. So when you talk about staining, staining is simply whereby you are adding a dye. Now the reason why you are doing this is because a lot of structures that are found in organisms tend to be clear, you know, transparent. So you find that when you observe, it becomes challenging for you to differentiate one structure from another. So dyes are added up. So when the dye is added up, you find that the structures absorb the dyes at different rates. So one turns darker than the other, the other is a bit lighter. So it makes it easier for you to differentiate between different structures. So staining enhances the clarity of objects. So it makes the specimen clearer, the details of the specimen clearer for you to see. Making thin sections. Now the sections of the specimen that you're supposed to be observing should be very, very thin. Now, the reason for this is because a lot of the microscopes, actually all the microscopes that are found in the school labs tend to be light microscopes. So they rely on light for illumination of the specimen. So light needs to be able to pass through the specimen. It cannot pass through specimens that are too thick. So the specimens need to be thin so, so that you can reduce the layer of cells and tissues to allow light to pass through for illumination of the specimen. Moving on to question 18. Set two means through which plants eliminate excess water. Another sweet, sweet question. Transpiration, gutation, evaporation. Part B. Explain the significance of hair on the human skin during cold weather. Okay, so what is the importance of hair on the human body? Now, what happens is that during cold weather, you know, when the temperatures are low, you're going to have erector pili muscles contract. So the hairs are attached to a muscle known as the erector pili muscle. So when the temperatures are low, this muscle contracts. So it causes the hair to become upright. This traps a thin layer of air between the hairs. Air is a good insulator. Now the reason why it's a good insulator is because air is a poor conductor of heat. So it will reduce the amount of heat that is lost from the body to the surrounding. Question number 19. The following diagram represents a stage in the mitotic division of a cell. A. Roman 1 identified the stage of mitosis illustrated. Roman 2, give a reason for your answer in 19A1. Okay, so this stage is the anaphase stage. Now, this is mitosis. So, I could have it to like anaphase 1, anaphase 2. No, it's just simply anaphase. Now, the reasons are as follows. The chromatids of each chromosomes have separated and they are moving towards the opposite poles. Part B, state the role of centrioles in cell division. Now, centrioles give rise to spindle fibers. So, spindle fibers are, of course, the ones through which the chromatids are attached to. 
Question number 20, state the significance of each of the following characteristics of living organisms. Okay, so what is the importance of irritability? Irritability enables organisms to seek favorable conditions and also escape unfavorable conditions. If you write either of these, it's correct. Part B, reproduction. So reproduction ensures continuity of species. You know, it prevents extinction of species. Question 21, the following diagram represents a mammalian tooth. Explain the structural adaptation of the tooth to its function. Okay, number one, what is this tooth? This is clearly a premolar and the reason for this is because it has two roots. So the adaptations of the premolar tooth are as follows. It has cusps. Now the cusps provide a large surface area for crushing and grinding of food. Number two is that, you know, another adaptation is that it has a broad surface to provide a large surface area for grinding of food. How does drinking of cold water immediately after a meal affect digestion? So when this happens, you'll find that the cold water lowers the temperature of the gut. Now, temperature is very, very important because digestion, as with many, many processes in our body, is actually controlled by enzymes which are sensitive to temperature changes so when the temperatures are lower you find that the enzymes are going to be inactivated this will slow down the rate of digestion question 22 explain the concept of natural selection among organisms in relation to an ecosystem with insufficient food so you have an ecosystem whereby the amount of food that is present is not sufficient for all organisms that is present. Now, whenever you have a resource that is not enough for everyone, what will happen is that competition will set in. So you're going to have competition for food. Now, after competition, what determines who emerges the winner? So the organisms that are best adapted to the environment, to that environment, are going to be the ones that will obtain food so they're going to be the ones that will consume the available food and survive and then of course they are going to progress to maturity reproduce and pass on these characteristics to their offsprings what about the unlucky organisms the unlucky individuals these are the ones that have characteristics that are not suitable to that particular environment so they will not have enough food and they will die and therefore will not pass on their characteristics to their offsprings and the characteristics will die with them over time our last question the following diagram represents a light microscope part a name the part labeled n so part n is the mirror state the functions of the parts labeled l and m okay let's look at that so what is l so l is actually the cause adjustment knob and m this is the condenser so the function of the cause adjustment knob is that it moves the body tube allowing you to focus roughly on the specimen bringing the space the image into rough focus and m is the condenser so this concentrate light rays onto the stage and that ladies and gentlemen brings us to the end of this lesson i hope you've enjoyed it by the way stay tuned i will be posting paper too soon inshallah see you then